yeah yeah good morning everybody i was just uh, uh, the goal of uh, uh, sharing today's session is basically uh, i'm just i'm just sharing the good things that i have learned over the last maybe few months because uh, i've been a, a freelancer or a solo solo developer as i'm calling it here for for a good decade and more for now, for for the i mean i first 10 15 years of my career was in a regular corporate job um in the telecom sector and in all these big um uh, mncs and all that but then uh, i branched off and became a freelancer quite early even before the trend caught on in india you know so i've been doing this for like 13 14 years now but uh, the learnings of the first few years and you know the, the exponential learnings of the last few months as such especially with this whole explosion with ai and open source tools and all that right so it has made life for a um, solo developer or a freelancer so much more um, easier and at the same time uh, so much more uh, challenging so i thought i'll share my experiences on how we can go about doing this whole process because as a freelancer you are a one man show right you have to design yourself you have to develop the product yourself at least a at least a pilot project yourself so that you can win the confidence of a of a prospective customer or maybe somebody who's interested in funding so to that extent you will have to get something up and going so that you can you know uh, present a vision present your vision you have to present your vision on paper and some some working system and then of course if you get get on on a concrete platform and if you're able to sell your idea to either a prospective customer or a funder then you go up, go about your regular delivery cycle then you have to get into the business of recruiting expanding your team and all that but until then until that stage when you are still uh, all in all in all you're doing everything yourself what are the different tools and tricks that can help you that is the goal of my talk today so uh, first things are uh, the i'll i'll touch the advantage first so solo developers the biggest advantage you know there are a lot see uh, uh, i'll give you my own example see uh, i was uh, in a very large conglomerate and you know mnc and you know hundreds of people around you and thousands of projects and a large hierarchy and i felt suffocated in that kind of environment you know so there are a lot of people who come out and become freelancers are people who want autonomy who want to take their decisions themselves today i want to slog i want to work 18 hours good tomorrow i want to take the day off good i want that kind of freedom and flexibility and at the same time i also want the freedom to experiment you know a new idea a new project a new deliverable if you are constrained by a corporate setup then you you need your approvals and team deadlines and all sorts of things right so this whole being solo is a huge uh, advantage in that sense you know there's nothing to constrain you from learning something new trying out something new so that i felt was my biggest advantage so uh, being a freelancer i am able to uh, there is no entry barrier you know i can jump into a new technology or a new framework just like that i think of it today and i start today and uh, do i need um, uh, a formal uh, training do i need a formal um, a nod from a customer to start with probably not the only thing i need is a uh, is a requirement need which i see in the market a business need that i see in the market how does that need get um, um, translated to me um, generally through peer circles say a friend or a colleague or some old um, uh, um, co college mate or somebody see uh, since we are all middle aged people a lot of our people in the peer circles they are all in big positions right so they might already have a startup of their own or probably they are a vp or a director in some company or or they are you know the, those sort of people so those kind of people they have a lot of need you know they have a lot of business need uh so in that case when they come to you with a business problem then you realize the existing set of solutions that are existing in the market are probably not suitable that is when we tend to branch out into a new idea altogether and it's too early to recruit and have a formal team and all that so that is when you want to develop solo and see if the idea is worth pursuing so that is the biggest advantage that i have seen um participating in the market as a solo person so that is my niche space you know taking a very a uh, vague market need or a business need and concretizing the idea making a product idea into a saleable technical solution proving that it can work at a poc level at a small trial beta level and then hand it over to a full fledged team that has always been my space so that's the space that i want to share information on of course the biggest challenge is uh, be uh, managing cost and managing effort how do you manage you uh, manage cost on a shoestring budget and manage effort because you are doing everything yourself so how do you prioritize okay 
so i'm starting with the first things first uh, uh as i was mentioning we have to do everything ourselves right we are solo here so by solo i mean not necessarily an individual it may be a group of say two three enthusiasts who are working together a small peer circle who share a uh, common interest so the first things first you get your um, um, product idea into place right so uh, your product uh, the guy who is giving you a product requirement or maybe you are generating your own requirement uh you have a vague one line uh, question in your mind right so this is the product idea that i am trying to uh, crack or this is the business need i am trying to satisfy so this kind of need is more more like a one liner it's very probing it's not very ac accurate so to make this more accurate what we do is something called an ux process right a business ux process so what we do is we take up uh, the uh, user scenario so you put yourself in the user's uh, uh, perspective and you try to eke out what kind of things that the user is actually feeling a need for okay so if, if he's a user who is on the move all the time then you give him a mobile app if the if he's a user who is a desktop guy who is an admin sort of guy back end guy he's a b2b guy b2c guy he's a he's a customer facing guy we we have to figure out what the user's profile is right so depending on the user's profile we do a user journey so one of the tools which i found very very useful for this space is figma okay so figma is a free tool and i'm just going to quickly jump over to my figma space just to give you an idea of how uh, it looks okay so this is these are the kind of user journeys that i'm trying to so presently i'm working in a uh, supply chain automation product so these are some of the uh, workflows okay so some of the information is uh, confidential so i'm not going to go into it detail so uh, see you i have a, a different users who are the different users in the space how do you say how do you send a quote how do you con um, uh, communicate with your suppliers where do you keep your data what kind of data you keep so this kind of designing process workflows and user workflows is very very convenient and intuitive in this tool called figma okay so figma is basically a collaborative tool but whatever is free available to a user is uh, a solo part where you can save all your uh, design workflows in the free plan okay but if you want to collaborate with somebody then you'll have to purchase it has some limited collaborations allowed for free but otherwise you have to uh, go for a paid version and i trust me in the last uh, i've been using figma for a few years now but i have never had to go for the paid version now the same figma allows me to go one step further okay so the first part is i have made the user experience i have designed some workflows i'm saying okay x user x that is the role user x has to do say let's say a create workflow or a or a administ administer workflow those kind of things like so you take a typical um, uh, you know uh, portfolio analysis fintech app or you take a retail app where you're doing some uh, shopping cart sort of thing or you have you want to sell your product online you are you're having a, you're already having a brick and mortar space you are already present you want to go online for the first time these are the kind of guys who are the guys who are experimenting with a small business web app for the first time right so for these kind of guys you identify your user and you identify the workflows that are critical for the user you show the sequence in which the product workflow the uh, uh, operation workflow goes okay now you have a workflow ready you have to show this in a visual screen space right so for this you use the same figma the face same figma has two parts one is the workflow part which is at a ideation level and one is the ui actual ui workflow part which is the screen level okay so now i'm going to jump to the second part of figma which is the screen level information so i have done the screen on figma which is like a, a library okay it's a repository of some documents okay so um, this is uh, just a tree and uh, some uh, some tags which are attached to it and you know you can filter and you can some common statistics that are associated with the, the with the screen and and some clicks to action you can upload you can create you can delete that sort of thing right so it's a very basic screen which you can apply in probably in any context whether it's a finance context or a retail context these kind of screens are dime a dozen in any of these contexts here i have a you know vertical bar where i have different different modules in my product so this sort of ui i want to design so typically what does a ux guy do supposing you um, you are looking for a, a full fledged ux guy to develop your system and give it a look and feel like this what happens is this kind of look and feel comes with figma uh, it, it's more like a vector space you know so each of these components 
they are all identified here as drag and drop components and they can also be grouped and they can be componentized in such a way that you can have layers. So now what happens is you can reuse this design in such a way that the HTMLs can be generated directly from Figma. So what I'm trying to say is a basic work prototype. For example, I'm just going to run here. OK. What happens is this screen comes to life within Figma then and there. I have not written one line of code, OK? But if you want to go to a, uh, you know, um, a funding guy or probably you want to give a small customer demo, this is all you need, right? So you just have a screen and you have a, a basic prototype ready in front of you. Can I do only a static screen? No, you can even do a, uh, you know, you can even do a running prototype. So you can say on click of this button, you go to another frame, you can link those frames. So even a running dynamic workflow can be made here. So this is one product which has really, really helped me in getting my ideas across. OK, so this is step one of my learning where a business idea, which is a very vague and a very, uh, you know, um, it, it's only verbal. It's still in your head. You want to concretize it. You want to put it on paper. You want to make a um, uh, prototype out of it and you want to uh, exchange ideas with people who are uh, other stakeholders. So you uh, you want to uh, rope in your funding guy, you want to rope in a prospective customer. So this is the best way I thought uh, this process helps. So I'll probably take a, a moment to pause here and if anybody has any experience to share on this space, you're welcome to do so. Anybody wants to say something on this? Any experience they've had? Anything they would need? Uh, what I've observed is uh, in the treasury space that I have worked on before. Uh -huh. uh, uh, well, let's say some of the major applications that we are talking about, uh, the major softwares like Calypso, Condor, do have an acceptable user interface and a user experience, uh, which uh, which is good. However, uh, you know, there are some packages, let's say right, RET, which is used in foreign exchange. Yeah. 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 Uh, now RET is something. Now FX is something that is very big in India. You know, foreign exchange is uh, one of the major aspects of trading in the Indian market. Uh, more than derivatives uh, and everything. Uh, so RET is one of the major applications. And as far as what I have used RET, RET doesn't have a very good user experience and user interface. Okay. So that was one of the uh, very big. Uh, I wouldn't say shock. Because I have come across other applications which are not, you don't have a very good user experience or user interface. But uh, given that the FX market is very large, let's say Calypso. I mean, you know, if you look at the derivatives interface, the, 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 the yep. interface and all that, the, the, the derivatives market in India is not that big. See, so uh, of course, you know, the, we are talking about that is the reason for this. You know, our guys in the fintech uh, space, they are still uh, part of the uh, MS Excel world. You know. So they are still used right. to tabular information and pivot tables and, and they are stuck in that paradigm. Correct, so correct, correct, correct. it will take them some time to come over to these, uh, you know, modern ways of uh, representing so, information and data. Exactly. So, you know, something like an RET, um, Rotters Electronic Trading, it's a RET system which captures FX trades. And uh, well, then if you really look for it from a business viewpoint, then FX is one of the major things. And RET is not a very user of any system. Sorry, your name is Anuradha, right? Uh, so right. What, what really happens is if you take the most stable systems, let's say Calypso, Condor and all that, uh, the system, a lot of times, if, you know, what happens is, let's say you have a box where, you know, like a Reuters or a Bloomberg box, and then the trade goes in there based on a conversation, and it gets captured in RET, and then it flows into Calypso. And right. So RET sometimes can become a headache. In terms right. of, uh, you know, to deal but, with, but so, uh, since you me, since you asked me, right? Trust me, there are, if, me, there are, if there is a problem, there are. I'm sure there are guys who are working on a solution for it. There is. I, I'm not sure. I'm there. not sure what's happening to it right now, but definitely. Yeah. So it's only a question of time. Okay. So let's get on to sure. the next part of the story. And the next part of the story is about um, now. Okay, now uh, at this stage, I, we presume that you've 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 got a buy-in either from a funding guy or from a customer, and and you're confident enough to go further. Your idea has merit. You've proved that. Okay, 
So now it's time to start off with the actual integrities of choosing your technology stack and all that, right? So how do you start? What do you need? So this space, uh, you need a proper techie, okay? So uh, there is uh, there is really no shortcut to this space. You need a techie who's experienced with you know enterprise uh, level uh, problem solving and who knows how to scale. Today you're starting with one customer, two customers, but tomorrow you'll have to uh, you know plan for scale, plan for two, two 24 bar seven reliability, plan for enterprise level security. So you need guys who can talk this language. OK, so at this space, it's worth investing in getting in a technical person on board. Um, he may or may not understand your business vision entirely, but it's good to have a peer circle of techies who can advise you on this space. OK, so if you are a, uh, if the person who is having the business idea who is not is not a techie, then I would advise that at this stage, please open one of your friends from your peer, peer circles to give you advice on this. Because this is not something that you can revise every now and then. OK, so this is a space, especially where uh, how do you choose your backend? How do you integrate? How do you scale these aspects? OK, so what I'm just going to uh, quickly list down some technology uh, alternatives that are popular in the market today for uh, both the front end and the back end. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. And more importantly, if I'm doing the same presentation, maybe one month later, I, my list may be something else. It is so fast paced. OK, but for today, uh, there are some things that people find uh, uh, most of the market is uh, hung, hanging on to. So uh, React and uh, uh, Angular have been around for a while now. Vue is a kind of a new kid in the block, uh, about um, maybe three, four years old. But uh, at the same time, uh, the best part of these uh, tools is, you know, uh, whether it is React or Vue or Angular, there are some, you don't have to start anything from scratch, OK? Nothing at all. For example, uh, I have for the recent project I'm doing on uh, a view has a framework called Quasar. OK, I just want to show you guys that framework. Quasar. This guy is a view based framework. OK, he has everything. OK, he has he has a layout. He has uh, components and I'll just show you. OK. So how, what kind of layout you want to have? You want to have a grid layout, dashboard layout. You want to have what kind of components you want to have in your page. Uh, uh, you want to have tables where you want to have charts. Everything is laid out for you. You don't have to build anything yourself. OK, you can just drag and drop and your layout will be ready. So this is at the UI level. These guys are and this is an MIT um, uh, open source framework and it's entirely free. And it has a lovely strong developer community which is continuously adding components to it. So this is one framework I thought which gives you a because I'm doing view presently. I'm sharing this information. There are similar uh, frameworks available in uh, uh, React and uh, 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 this one also uh, Flutter also. Flutter is one unique case. Uh, Flutter is a case where you need to be uh, agnostic of the device the user is using. OK. So generally view and react and all are more um, you know assuming that you are sitting in front of a computer and ideally you have a big monitor some guys have two monitors so there is a lot of screen space real estate available in front of you so typically in those kind of cases you develop a react or a view application so but there are some guys who want to say um, my user may be sitting on the desktop he may be on the move so sometimes he will view it on a mobile browser sometimes he will use view it on his pc so i want a, a framework which is device agnostic so for such kind of guys flutter is an excellent choice because flutter generates um, uh, your see ultimately everything is just html css and javascript right so let's say you have a very very powerful backend python based backend and there's hardly any business logic that on uh, that is there on your ui your ui is very very light in that case, you don't even need all these jazzy guys. Just get a good um, uh, HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript based uh, UI uh, page, a couple of pages done and you're set. You're all good to go. You need all these jazzy frameworks only when there is some amount of UI work to be done. So in that case, you choose one of these technology alternatives at the front end. So uh, uh, the um, newest kit on the block, as I was telling you, is Vue. Angular is good if you want more of visualization, more of complex data management. 
uh, and very less um, what can i say uh, user in uh, uh, reactivity you know like a lot of things that the user does has to go back and forth and come when you want a very reactive native looking interface then you go for either react or view the next set of alternatives are at the back end so um, if you they see there are guys see uh, uh, i have not mentioned it here but one of the very practical reasons why people stick to a technology background nowadays is uh, the skill set they have right it's not really because you are a solo guy right so you can't afford to learn a new technology uh, from scratch and if you are especially hard pressed for time let's say you are you've been a javascript guy all along or you've been a python guy all along you don't want to start from scratch and learn something else right so one major reason why technology is chosen by startups or solo developers are what they already know so they are constrained by their knowledge space which they already possess so if you are already strong on the js side then node js is a pretty good backend there's no problem at all for hosting uh, simple rest apis you can use an express backend uh, maybe your application is very uh, it's a very straight forward uh, data transformation data uh, process it uh, expose rest apis and show a couple of screens on your um, uh, page web pages and you have a dashboard and you have a couple of screens a couple of charts and tables that's it that's all you want to do right so for that kind of thing uh, doing everything in node is perfectly okay or you're a python guy you're not comfortable with the javascript universe at all no problem uh, there are some uh, ui frameworks available purely for python try out something called streamlit it's very good so streamlit is one um, um, i'll probably just open it for you streamlit it, this is for a python guy okay who doesn't want to get into the uh, javascript space at all so streamlit is a place where you don't have to write any front end uh, uh, code um, i mean front end specific code uh, you don't need to know see this is this is the way you write uh, uh, your first application that's it this is your page your page is ready so you don't need to learn the nitty gritties of you know your html and how do you write your tags and h1 and h3 and table and, you don't need to do all that simple python code and you have a ui okay so this is for guys who are very very comfortable with the python space so like this are there frameworks available for uh, ruby on rails yes uh, so for the all of these frameworks the most common reason why people choose a backend is their level of comfort sometimes the other cases okay you have shown a uh, presentation to a customer and he already comes with some legacy uh, technology which is already attached to he already has one product he wants you to commission another product which is tangential related to it so now he comes with his own baggage right he says no 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 i am having history of all these applications which are already deployed on python i cannot move to node i cannot move to express you give me a python solution so these kind of situations are also some limitations that you have to live with so this is the space where a solo developer has to quickly make the jump to a new technology and that is why i said is an advantage for a solo guy because if you are a huge team and you know you have to reskill your entire team that's a baggage that you have to live with however if you are an individual and you are a techie who is willing to learn then the sky is the limit you can learn anything today uh, and you don't need to spend, spend a single pi to learn a new technology just to give you a heads up i have learned uh, technologies probably on an average of uh, you may be uh, at least one language or one framework every 6 months and until today i have not spent a single rupee in reskilling myself not a single rupee it's always happened free of cost just with the publicly available information on the net simple here yeah, a need necessity is the mother of invention you want to do something you want to tackle a business problem you will go looking for solutions that that uh, actually answer that problem so it's all been need based okay the next set of decisions that you need to take as the database level so uh, typically in all our architectures today we have three levels right the front end the back end and the database so i'm not actually talking about the uh, intermediaries like your your uh, dockers and your orchestration and your kubernetes and so those are uh, docker is still a good idea even if you are a small guy even if you are just having um, you know just one customer on board even then it is good to dockerize your application because you are separate you are bringing in a separation of layers right so you want to develop the um, ui at a very small scale today you want to enhance the ui you want to add a new module so if you dockerize it then your back end will be uh, independent and they can talk to each other neatly cleanly maybe just using a set of rest apis and all that so uh, the database choices 
in today's world the no sql choices are abundant so no sql choices are very very suitable when you want to do a uh, 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 basically when your data is uh, fast changing right uh, you, it's very dynamic it, it doesn't have a structure the real time data coming in so for those kind of spaces um directly plugging in your data uh um, json support these kind of things your no sql is very good by the way there is a good heads up i wanted to give you guys to share postgre has come out with their um, new version and that version is uh, actually uh, a combination of both they give you a good old rdbms as well as a no sql support so it's as good as you know they've as, as good as followed mongodb so you can do a, a, a no sql and an rdbms both using postgre so that's one useful uh, info that i realized recently then there are some th something called graph dbs which are very useful for um, when your data is highly interconnected you know so uh, you want to have transformative data you have um, uh, primary data which is unfiltered data coming in continuously maybe a real time feed i'll give you an example real time feed maybe something like um, you know you have uh, iot devices connected to say cctv cameras continuous cctv feed coming in so for these kind of spaces you know these graph dbs like um, neo4j and all are very useful you want to try you have to you want to say you want a baby minder in your car and you have a cctv feed somewhere so these kind of things graph dbs are useful then of course in memory databases for small devices for um, uh, specific applications which are uh, maybe uh, on prem small specific devices you want to have then in that case you use an in memory database of course you have to be very careful with your caching techniques here uh, oh, this this is information is purely for techies who are uh, dealing with um, systems with limitations red resource limitations and of course comes your good old relational database and as i was saying postgre has now migrated from being a pure rdbms to a uh, no sql as support as well then comes some i just want to share a list of so this list is not exhaustive by any means okay so i'm just giving you some list of frameworks and uh, and mind you all these are free entirely open source entirely free so uh, i just want to share my um, the last this probably the last 6 months um, these are the frameworks which have really really found uh, i i found awesome so uh, canva and figma are almost interchangeable um, uh, both of them are um, ui and graphic design platforms figma is collaborative when it is paid uh, otherwise it's an individual prototyping tool airflow airflow is a tool which is open source and which is uh, uh, which is really uh, uh, revolutionizing the data transformation space okay so if you want to build a, a complex data pipeline you know so you have unrefined unstructured data coming in from multiple sources it has to be cleaned up it has to be um, you know uh, do some uh, model transformation change it from one format to another map it to different different kind of user spaces uh, build a workflow Um, user, it has support for something called DAGs. You know, basically your acyclic graphs. So for designing your data sequence pipelines, then your data goes back and forth, iterative data management, and finally you deliver it. In for some people, you know, you don't even need to write a single line of code. Just a combination of Airflow and Superset will do. Airflow can do your data transformations, and Superset will give you a support for showing it in uh, charts and tables and visual basic visualization. So some people just need to do that, you know. Uh, I have a friend who is um, doing water management. I'm not sure if her team is here, Bhakti. So uh, she has a set of um, uh, water management solutions that she's trying to develop. So her her use case is very basic, you know, but um, it is data intensive. so they will collect data water um, consumption data from all different different apartments and government buildings and all that and they will try to show their water consumption patterns and say see um, uh, your water is getting wasted because of uh, you know pipeline burst or because you are not reusing water so they don't need any sophisticated ui they just need to show some graphs and charts and notifications you know so for such kind of guys you don't need any ui at all just a, uh, a you know a data pipeline of how you transform and structure your data and then finally how you render it using your visualization platforms just a combination of figma airflow and superset is enough you don't need anything else okay then uh, there is another um, in the python space i found one uh, uh, tool which is very useful uh, which is pydantic 
uh, basically there's a lot of people who are doing um, a rest based co communication between their server and uh, client right so let us say uh, um, um, two of you are getting uh, the i'm just explaining the real scenario that is presently happening for me um, me and a couple of my friends i'm doing the front end my friend is doing the back end that sort of thing so how do we talk to each other uh, through rest apis so uh, the back end will expose some rest apis the front end i'm developing in view and uh, they talk to each other and uh, uh, every time a new api is added the api uh, the api is added in a tool called swagger so the back end is exposing a new function a new functionality and the ui will be uh, the ui guy doesn't even need to go and bother about what changes are happening at the back end uh, this uh, pydantic will ensure that the schema is validated and the perfect api is exposed to the uh, front end and swagger will tell me exactly what kind of apis i'll give you an example of how swagger looks um where is it uh, yeah okay so this these are the set of uh, apis that my backend is exposing and that's it so i know exactly what i can use in my ui need screen what kind of data comes from the backend whether i should um, uh, show it as a string show it show it as a number or show it as a date so if the if the backend says okay i'm sending you a date component i know that i have to uh, render this guy is a string let us say if this had been a date i know i have to render a date component on the front end so this kind these kind of tools help communication make it seamless between the front end and the back okay so now i'm going back where is my presentation when you have a million uh, screens open the biggest problem is figuring out which is the one you are presently in okay so the next thing that i found very very useful is mayan okay mayan is an edms it's a document management system see almost all of us are trying to develop um, uh, business applications where there is a huge repository of some kind of document involved right you want to source some templates some documents some xml um, uh, you know reports and files and some uh, some uh, data or some uh, data which is available as word documents or or somebody uh, upload some um, uh, data in excel and you want to extract information from excel show it as a dashboard on your front end then you want to do some versioning maintain multiple versions of that template v1 v2 i it is going for editing reviewing then probably you want to manage um, uh, versioning then you want to manage user level locking unlocking when uh, when i am modifying this template you don't modify uh, then you want to um, uh, have maybe uh, a folder level repository management uh, you want to create a product structure project structure file explorer these are very very common requirements that come for almost every startup guy who is making a business application because everybody is dealing with some resource or the other right you are dealing with some kind of resource so the resource is either a file resource or a database resource so if you have to manage file resources you don't have to reinvent the wheel there are some very very good edms platforms available in the market and mayan is one of them it allows you to manage i'll probably show you how my have i opened it yeah i guess i've opened it see uh, this is what i mean i'll probably zoom it a little okay so you can uh, okay so how many documents what was which user is opened which document how many were added you want to send notifications if a new document has been added to the repo automatically these things are managed you want to set a new workflow a new document has come into the uh, repo and you want to send a trigger to some pipeline automatically the new doc say let's say i have a new um, equi i'm i'm doing some equity analysis i've got a new uh, equity portfolio um, data for this month it has got added to the edms to the document management uh, repo so when the repository has a new file automatically i can trigger a new workflow so this mayan guy has a um, support for workflows so you can directly plug in a python workflow and automatically the data processing of, of that excel file will start and you can continue doing your um, uh, all the processing pipeline activity so this very very seamlessly merges into your scheme of things so this is one other framework which i found very very useful so you can tag and you can uh, manage hierarchies hierarchies of your document or maybe if you are going into multi tenancy tomorrow you have multi multiple customers so you can manage customer level document repositories all that is possible within this then of course i think hugging face is the newest kid on the block which everybody is fascinated about 
so uh, uh, you have uh, you are you are trying to dabble in uh, different different business spaces and you are looking for good data sets in that space uh, you want a good nlp model you want to manage uh, uh, your uh, ai uh, you want to see what kind of accuracy levels others are getting you want to uh, so this is your own private space just like how chat gpt is your uh, you know uh, universal um, uh, 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 ai tool um, hugging space gives you uh domain specific ai tools so i'll just give you an example probably i have opened it somewhere maybe i'll probably just open hugging space yeah okay so it's a ai community which allows you to search for different different data sets so i was just giving you an example right so i let me look for something in equity so say i i want to do some equity versus debt analysis okay something generally versus debt see somebody has already done it equity versus debt so you can take this data set you can take the space that they have already worked on you can see what kind of results they are getting and you can plug this into your this, this is your language model which you can plug into your application you can you can collaborate with this person you can enhance it further that kind of thing i found uh, all weird see uh, for example let me show something else some image image processing uh, computer vision data processing even some um, things uh, for example i was talking about this water management right so some sustainability data all kinds of see sustainability data so they are they have some data on you know uh, rainfall patterns and um, uh, city level um, um, you know um, temperature and all all that information is available so these are all your private data sets which are available for the domain level and some amount of processing which people have done on each of these data sets so this is another very very useful space so if you have a data model if you are own you can probably plug it to hugin face or you can collaborate with other people and that sort of space so it's basically a collaborative space for uh, nlp models okay so these are just some of the things that i wanted to share uh, there are so many more but you know um, there's no point in just listing them for listing sake right you only choose frameworks and library based on need so when you get down out there and when you start developing when you you know you have a specific need that is when you will go looking for a particular framework and more often than not i have found that only 10 or 20% value add i need to put in from my side 70 80% of the background work somebody has already put in so that is a huge learning for me in the last few months okay so now comes the next story of the uh, new kid on the block the uh, chat uh, the copilots which are helping uh, 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 um the developers designers not just developers guys even design for example you want to do a data translate um, data transformation right so you take a um, you take some you pay i'll give you an example okay so let us say i have some uh, uh, some business level documentation some um, uh, some i something has, that has come to me in a, in a document in a word doc i will copy paste that document into um, uh, chat gpt and then i will give it some annotation saying extract um, the following information from this document um, uh, the maybe it's a legal contract for example extract the uh, contract start date extract the, uh, the date of renewal of the contract extract the different different parties who are um, uh, the who are the signatories of the contract then extract um, some something else what are interest rate something so i can give these three four uh, annotations or uh, uh, tags that i want to extract from it like a json if you give this guy chat gpt will give you the uh, actual extracted summary information text annotated summary so it is that good is it 100% accurate absolutely not we, we all know that you have to take it with a pinch of salt but it gives you a very very good starting point and um, there are many other uh, two copilots like that kite is one codota but yeah for a, for a for a solo guy who doesn't want to spend money chat gpt is good enough for example i'll just show you uh, um as you can see here my vs code is open my code is open and at the same time chat gpt is always open always open for something or the other so see even to the extent that you know this one line that i have written about hugging face i didn't write it myself i pulled it out of chat gpt i was so lazy that even this presentation i didn't make myself so i just wanted to i just wanted to write about some see this this ppt this line right this i got it from chat gpt 
and why so much i am using um, i am not using ppt to show you my uh, data right i am using an app called gamma gamma is a online ai based uh, presentation framework and what did i do did i make this ppt myself no i just went to gamma and i said uh, okay this is a presentation topic please generate a deck for me it generated a deck and then i just added i said okay in this deck can you add a slide for backend can you add a slide for db can you add a slide this is all i did can you move the flutter slide on top can you add one line about swagger this is all i did i and probably i spent a good 20 minutes to make this whole slide presentation that's all so the whole idea is reuse you know something it's not see you, a person who doesn't know things will probably not be able to exploit these tools well but if you know your stuff you don't have to spend time on the rudimentary things of getting things up and running okay so this that is why i was talking about copilots so for the time being chat gpt is good enough so there is one um, decision that you know uh, uh, i've i've in all the developing developer circles that i've been interacting with recently you know there is a uh, big dilemma that is going on in the uh, uh, developer circles for example people in the 15 20 year experience bracket let's say you have a new business idea uh, people like ram will resonate with this idea uh, okay you are you are you are one guy now now you are you want to go further you want to scale your product you want to get on with a new guy you want to start recruiting people so should i recruit one or two developers maybe get a get a python guy get a react guy get a back end guy database guy whatever should i do that sort of thing or should i simply take a paid license for a vs code copilot and that's it it can act as an extra developer for me which is cheaper which is more enriching which is more productive so there is an ethical aspect to this um, of course uh, job the, the jobs uh, getting lost and you know new kids on the block not getting jobs so there is an ethical aspect to this whole business but purely from a business owner perspective it is a decision that you have to take is it enough if you just get a license for a copilot and then you can expand your scope and scale with that itself or do you need an extra pair of hands to do this so this is one decision that you have to take at the appropriate time that's it now we have already come to the uh, so now we presume that you have used all these tools you have set up your system and your your coding phase is done and you are done your unit testing and you are ready to put it uh, on to um, uh, some kind of a provider cloud provider um, uh, to start with right to start with we are not talking about uh, the scale uh, i mean ultimately you might have to go to a google cloud or um, somebody was talking about uh, hosting their application on firebase and uh, you want to get more formal you want to get aws on board it is uh, see aws more than a a, a, a framework of um, repute it has it's acts like a, a label for uh, startups nowadays if you go and say if you go and tell your investor or your customer hey i am hosted on aws that itself is like a badge of honor you know they they trust you this like oh okay this guy is on aws okay so he comes with certain degree of reliability certain degree of um, uh, availability 24 bar 7 that sort of thing so it has become more like a badge of uh, you know like a certification badge so that is one reason but otherwise there is one uh, uh, new uh, cloud provider that um, not really new but i came across it recently there is one e2 a uh, cloud provider called e2e uh, i may have opened it let me just check so this guy is uh, e to e cloud okay this guy's pricing in india is very 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 competitive okay so um, with just maybe a 2k or 2.5k in a month you can run you can host your application on into e and it's pretty decent it, it has um, uh, it has good gpu support of course um, uh, if you take a aws for 6 months for startups is free and all that so if you already have a customer uh, pipeline lined up you have two three guys to pay and you are you are you are okay you are sorted on the funding side then you can consider starting with aws or starting with azure um, uh, depends on the customer what he insists but if you are bootstrapping starting on your own and you are very very conservative on cost you can consider guys like this this guy has pretty decent reliability uh, we have already hosted some enterprise level uh, apps on this and it's pretty decent it's it's going good no issue at all okay so i have reached the uh, fag end of my talk i just want to talk about one last thing 
all this is good all this is great now you have to monetize your app and start making it um, it has to start paying for you right so there are four ways in which you can monetize from what i can see first is the freemium model you I mean, in today's world unless you give away something for free nobody you can't attract crowd right you can't attract um, um, some amount of um, uh, subscription uh, you have to show some amount of um, base user base you have to show so the freemium model is the most popular model start something for free uh, even the mit frameworks which we are seeing you know the so many frameworks which are which are in the market the open source models that we were talking about you know all those guys most of them operate on the premium model they give some basic things for free but when you become a sophisticated user when you want to scale when you want, when you have a enterprise customer on board then you want move on to the premium paid version so that is one very very good route to take then of course uh, a different contact kind of content that you are showing then the advertising model works especially if you are showing media content so uh, if you are showing media content then it makes plenty sense to go into the uh, advertisement model insert your uh, based on impressions and sign ups and all that based on um, uh, your the traditional route but yes this is for media rich applications then of course comes the affiliate marketing play space this is for uh, primary good good for influencers so show social media influencers so let us say you are uh, you know you are um, uh, you are good with product review you are good with mobile phone unboxing videos that sort of thing you have that kind of expertise or you are very good you are very good with um, uh, 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 car um, you know uh, breaking down a car parts and explaining and that sort of thing all those sort of videos you want to put or you want to write um, uh, you want to collaborate on that space then you can you know set up a peer network and you can get on with some affiliates you can sign up with some uh, you know car service um, network affiliates or if you're doing a food blog kind of thing you tie up with uh, swiggy that sort of thing affiliate marketing and you can get commission for their videos for all these sort of things uh, you know there are specific depending on the business idea you have to choose the right kind of monetization strategy and of course in app purchase if you if you're doing retail commerce so these are the typical ways in which you can monetize Okay, I'm done. This is the end of my um, uh, information sharing. So the conclusion that I would like to say is, uh, you do not have to be intimidated by the fact that you are a one-man army. In today's world, one person with the help of all these various tools and frameworks, and of course, with a good peer circle where you can, you know, like people who can act as a sounding board, who can talk to you, who can give you advice at the right time, that is enough to get started. that is the message i wanted to pass you don't really need a grand team in place right on day one so that is the biggest message that i want to pass i'm done thank you for listening and i'm open for questions okay thank you anybody has any questions um and i have a question uh, so i i have been a solo developer myself trying to do a saas application on myself so like you said there are like lot of uh, frameworks and libraries that we come across also when we try to work on different aspects like on the front end and the back end and then we try to go into database and then we start learning something i what i feel is i get bogged down into learning the integrity of everything and then i spend a lot of time getting to the depth of it i actually lose track of my development itself right. so Uh, where do we stop at this and uh, come back to our track see where to stop is is simple. see it's always like uh, the end justifies the means right what is the end the end is maybe you want to make a small poc to convince the um, uh, prospect to buyer or a funder or a customer right so that is our starting point right only till that stage you need to be a solo guy after that you have resources at your disposal maybe funding maybe um, maybe a team and all that will flow the moment you have a backing right so remember all this business of experimentation is only to make a a beta trial poc kind of level for that what you need to know only that you learn don't go into the depth so for example you, you just you can run everything on your solo machine and you can show it right so you don't need to learn about how do you orchestrate how do how do you do cloud providing how do you do 24 bar 7 you don't need that information today you just need to understand how your back end talks to your front end in a neat way and you know what is your customer profile your customer is going to be a, a web app guy he's a browser guy he's a he's a desktop guy 
to that extent if you understand those specific technologies it's enough so be very very narrow in your scope be very stingy in your learning in your first few days don't learn for learning sake learn to just meet an end okay yeah 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 thanks um hello i have a question yeah. um so you mentioned about the the peer group right yeah so how do you how do you uh, get that peer group you know the right kind of people <laughs> who can support you well, this is a challenging thing right so finding Please. the right people i completely um, agree which background are you from ravi so i i am not from a technical background honestly <laughs> so i can understand yeah but so you you are come from business background huh? yes yes correct okay so, so i'm an mba yeah um see this is a big problem uh, for non techies to get into the tech product space is a big problem i agree there is a huge entry barrier because you know these techies um, among techies we have a lot of friends but we have very few business friends and vice versa business guys will have friends in their own peer circles right so uh, yeah. one uh, you will have to co opt a techie i'll tell you the brutal fact behind this see we are talking about products in different different domain spaces right fintech product retail product pharma product this product that product but ultimately the honest part of the story is it's all a tech product right it's a tech product which is actually dealing with a, a data set which is specific to that domain but the underlying product is a tech product so you will have to co opt one technical person who is ready to share your journey so one way of doing it is you um, uh, try to uh, the, i have seen people who are who who extend open in, invitations on their linkedin profiles saying this i have a business idea in so so space are you willing to collaborate with me i have really seen people getting good coordinations here so this okay. so uh, be active on linkedin try to find that's one space and the other space that people get is these forums like for example you if, if, let's say you are doing a fintech product and uh, there are these startup forums right uh, there you can get some help and uh, there are some okay. other spaces where you can get help is there are some people who are doing these incubator uh, programs right so if you have a good business uh, see for to start with as i was telling you right if you just get familiar with figma and if you can translate your idea into a visual effect no that is enough to convince a customer or probably a funder that you have your idea has some has some meat in it so then you can go about into get one of these incubator programs and try to co-opt a techie who can help you out share your vision and all that so these are ways in which you can enter the market but i completely agree for a non techie to enter this space there is a barrier there is a barrier so probably after this call we can you can re, i can have probably help you you know or your specific business problem what kind of people can help you on an individual level we can see i'll try to see if i can pass on some feeder some feeders in my network and somebody who can collaborate with you sure sure yeah thank you yeah sure any other question uh hi anuradha let's say uh, i have a question that uh, let's say you developed an api endpoint or a couple of api endpoints and uh, you tested it through postman right okay. and uh, you uh, maybe uh, the response time was bad i uh, uh, think one, one second or so and you managed it to uh, push it to uh, 300 milliseconds and okay. you go to test this and uh, you uh, you know verified it through postman and everything okay. so how do you uh, uh convince the business team to uh, you know adopt the new uh tech uh this so transition to new uh tech stack or say new library okay. or do you don't do it at all how, how do you like uh, it entirely you know? depends on my business case right so if you are okay. dealing with real time data and where where time is of the essence then it really see what you are talking about is 3x improvement in response time right from 1 yeah. second to it 3x that's a huge jump okay that is not a small jump that is worth migrating to so this these things build if you see if you are uh, again it's it's a question of 
cumulative time lag, right? If it's just one operation and that one operation is giving you a, uh, let's say you have a screen uh, loading some data, say some stock data or some, as I was giving some couple of examples, right? Some some CCTV footage data and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So CCTV footage data, one second lag doesn't matter because it's, it, ma it does not matter if you're doing post-mortem. For example, if somebody's already stolen something and gone, you are trying to see who is uh, who it is, you are trying to analyze your CCTV feed. However, mm -hmm. if you're doing live web streaming and you want to monitor live computer vision data, there one time is of the essence. There, your business need will drive them to adopt the new tech stack automatically. So if Response time is a business case. Automatically, it will translate into tech. So always remember, need only translates into tech. Tech does not automatically translate into need. So do things only when your business drives you to do it. Okay. Okay. So if there is a need, they will automatically migrate. I'm sure. Anybody else? See, the problem why people don't migrate easily is the uh, overhead involved in testing again, getting it stable again. The, those are problems people want to avoid, right? Resistance to change comes from there. So there are some people who do uh, this, um, you know, um, I, I can give you an example. There are some uh, um, startup teams who do this A-B testing concept. Uh, they they experience um, uh, once they segment their user base into two parts. The old um, one set of segment user segment will be exposed to the old tech stack with probably uh, as you were saying old performance data old tech stack and then another set of users who will be exposed to the new tech stack new de deployment and then they will it's a limited trial kind of thing they will see what kind of feedback they get and based on that they will convince the team that okay it's worth migrating to the uh, uh, entirely to the new tech stack so these are all different different ways in which you can approach this. Hello, uh, I just uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to highlight. I attended a previous session with another man, and Arvind knows him. And I think uh, the other person is a very experienced person, and he showed us a tool on, you know, uh, this network monitoring thing, which is actually you know which monitors packets and all that. So, uh, so, so, so that I, I think that was a very interesting tool, a very advanced one, a uh, very sophisticated one, uh, because. We do have a lot of problems. About like is he talking about Wireshark? No, no. Probably you are talking about browser, Chrome Dev Tools. No, no, no. What, what, what? No, no, no. It's uh, a yeah, JavaScript yeah, the talk. Showed, showed us a tool, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It so, is a JavaScript talk. It it's a JavaScript talk. He was showing the Chrome Dev Tools. Oh, okay. I'll just show you. Okay. Is, is this what you're talking about? I'll just show you. Uh -huh. One second, huh? I'll just show you my name. Okay, it's on 88. Uh, recently, it's... Um, oh, just a sec. I just recently flushed the cache. See, it's basically, uh, uh, see, even for for anything for that matter, right? When you say, when you just do a right click and you say inspect, right? Any web page. Uh -huh. See, this is a this is some public web page, right? So let's say. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It wasn't this. It was the network statistics and all that. Something like see, that. That is also there here. Uh, uh, so, okay. All uh, right. All oh, right. Yeah. Everything is there inside this itself. Okay. Oh, so let's say you do some, you click on this and then you come yeah, and you yeah, see, yeah, can yeah. you see? It will tell you exactly right, right, right. which which site took how much time. No, oh, that's that's very nice. Yeah, I think it's this that he showed. No, yeah, so these are the sort of things. Right. Okay. So this is what we used to debug, for example. So let's say at some stage it is taking too long, no? So we use this to debug. Which, which act uh, not only debug in terms of performance, debug in terms of re re response and all that. See, um, response 200 bits, okay, I've got a response. 
response 404 means I've not got a response. So how will a UI guy know whether the data is coming properly from the backend? We use these, these kind of tools and this is all embedded in Chrome, no, nothing special. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I'm with that. Anything yeah. else? Yeah. Do you recommend any? Uh... Uh, so, okay, let the other guy speak, please. Peter, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do you recommend any specific IDs and the specific plugin for solo developers? You know, and in the I'm happy with VS Code. I'm happy with VS Code. Okay. What language? Yes, any language? Yeah, it opens any language. Yes. That's the advantage of VS Code. It has plugins for. See, VS Code is Microsoft's. Uh, uh, you remember earlier we uh, we used to do Visual Studio now only for C, C plus plus that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. But then they Microsoft realized that the Java world is, uh, you know, too dominant and they can't still survive only with C, um, developer tools only for C, C++. So they shortened uh, Visual Studio to VS and they called it VS Code. And now it is an open source tool. Uh, it can it can pretty much run any programming language, Scala, Ruby on Rails, anything. The reason be it has extensions for each language, not only developer extensions, it has extensions for unit testing, it has extensions for form code formatting, lint, for everything. So uh, you can uh, you can plug in data, you can you, all sorts of things. For every language, it has a it has an ecosystem for every programming language. So I pretty much use VS Code. Of course, there are other guys also, but uh, this is what I use. Good. And also, where do you see that, you know, do you advise uh, the developers to uh, leverage low-code, no-code tools in the initial phase of their... Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I agree. I agree, you know. Code only if you need to. Though I am a developer, though I am a techie, I will say, code only if you need to. Because the uh, it depend when you are a solo guy, your effort is very, very uh, precious, right? And coding is intense effort. If you are not, um, if you, if you are all alone, you should your focus should go on uh, meeting the end goal. The end goal is to expand your product and to see it coming to life, right? You don't want it to remain an idea in your head. You want to see it coming to life. So then, in that case, the goal is to convince um, a buyer or convince a funder that okay, this idea has merit and let's go ahead. Let's let's make a product out of this. So that is your goal. So if that is your goal, there is no point in uh, writing code if the prototype itself will do the trick. So start coding only when you want to show some value add through code, especially value add in terms of data transformations. Your data is coming in, in some kind of unstructured way and you're doing some transformation and you want to show the data in a transformed manner in your UI, then you code because there the user will get the power of the uh, application. He can visualize the power of the application. Only then you code. Otherwise, if you can manage with your um, uh, prototypes, good, well and good. Thank you. Uh, one of, uh, just, just one thing, a uh, couple of things. Uh, affiliate marketing, I don't think so far. Uh, well, years ago, well, 30 or 40, 35 years ago, I, I, I had some exposure to affiliate marketing, but I guess the affiliate marketing of that flavor wasn't really, well, at that point in time, wasn't really that great. Would that be correct? That's right, because today it is tightly coupled with social media, right? Correct. Yeah. That is the yeah. reason why yeah. affiliate marketing has, has taken off in a big way now. If you are right, a right, right, if you are an influencer and you have you know a peer circle of influence, then it makes plenty right. of sense. Absolutely. So obviously that everything open, you know, I, I guess now people are now trying to get the whole affiliate marketing thing working in a better yeah. fashion. It depends on what your app wants to deliver. It wants to deliver a, deliver a solution. It wants to deliver a okay. recommend. Okay. What does it want to deliver? Well, I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, somebody introduced me to him like 30, 30 years ago, and well, it was very unimpressive. Let's put it <laughs> and, and very, very, at very nascent stage. Let's put right. it this way. Right. Uh, I guess people are, I mean, long after now, so many years have passed, I guess, uh, what I feel is now people are trying to improve the whole scenario when it comes to affiliate marketing. Yeah. One thing. Uh, the other thing that I would like to think about, talk about is obviously that, you know, we're talking about Angular JS and Virtual Evar City has got an Angular JS aspect. Uh, a slight certification. So again, these are very introductory certification sort of thing. And I guess what you asking is a very one in a unique sort of 
sort of uh, offering, but they are free. So they don't take any money for it. So I just went ahead. Right. Uh, one of the things is QA. Now, in terms of what are you going to do with the future, uh, how exactly does QA come into the picture? So, uh, so you know, because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, well, let's say the softwares that we have, uh, you know, do, software does have QA issues. Uh, See, uh, QA, QA has three or four um, dimensions to it. Dimensions to it. At the back end level, you want to make sure that your data is well validated, so you you can do some schema validation. I was talking about a tool called Pydantic. It's a very good schema validator. That's at the back, at the database level. Then at the server level, at the server level, you can have um, um, you can have frameworks which do business logic level validation. And at the front end, you probably you you will probably hook, hook on to something like Selenium, which will do UI level automation, and you know um, so, so that uh, right. it can recreate use cases and all that. So it depends. It depends on QA you want to do at what layer. And QA is more important before you deliver it to a to a third party, right? Uh, presently, we are still talking about solo and I'm me, I me myself kind of thing. So you are your own QA. You are your own QA. You have no choice. All right, of course. I mean, how does how does agile fit into the whole picture? You know, agile, if, you are a, if you're a group of people and you want to coordinate on a daily basis, then agile is a method. There is a method to that madness. That's all. So if you want to, you know, instead of just haphazardly picking up the call and talking to people, you fix a schedule, fix a scope for every day's effort, and you know, meet at the same time, discuss focused points, and come back, finish that, and come back. It's that sort of thing. So I guess because the traditional methodologies have got QA issues, then Agile would address the continuous QA. There's something called the continuous QA. There is something called uh, CI and CD. I think many of our techie friends know. Uh, it's called continuous integration and continuous deployment. So in today's yes, world, yes. Yeah, we don't indeed, talk right. the server and you know do a grand upgrade. We don't do that sort of thing. Right. Continuously, Agile. every small change that you make, you yeah. push it. That's it. That's the sort of thing world we live in today. So the risk is also minimized, right? Because you're making incremental changes to your system. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that's one thing. And then, of course, I, I think Agile has got to see, I, again, you, you talked about continuous integration and continuous delivery, again, okay, with that sort of thing in mind. Yeah. So that's very interesting. And I did come across this when I was reading, reading the Agile material. That's yeah. uh, and then, uh, this, uh, so that was the QA, and then there's one more thing. We, 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 will, we, will, we will definitely discuss this. Sure. Uh, sure. Okay, I'm done from my side. Yeah, Thank thanks. you for coming. If you have any more questions, you are free Hello. to ask. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? What, what, yeah, again, what, again, you, what, 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 what do you think about extreme programming as, as a concept? <laughs> Well, extreme programming is undergoing a sea change with these co-pilots now, right? Yes. Because these co-pilots today, they are extreme in nature, actually. So you may have a, a certain idea in mind and they suggest, a, they, they are capable of suggesting a completely different way of doing the same thing. So they challenge, a, a solo developer is constantly challenged by these co-pilots. It is a it complements you as well as it, it it contradicts you. So that way, I find this uh, pair programming, extreme programming, these paradigms are now not anymore human to human. They are more human to machine. It's that's the space we have entered into now. I mean, oh, sorry, uh, rather one of the things that I observed in the past, and I, I, I always found this very clear, uh, is you see there are a lot of times when a, well, let's say a programmer. You know, like uh, it generates output. Then, uh, well, it get measured. It gets measured by uh, lines of code per hour. So what people do is just give that figure that this guy wrote this get got this output. And when they actually talk to you, uh, assign work to you, they don't talk about a time frame. You see, you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, ah. Yeah. Uh, Wow. So uh, I think I think they're I think all yeah, these yeah. problems from the old world where uh, coding was entirely a human domain, right? So a developer right. 
one developer so how you know in big enterprises what we do is we have a productivity chart and we will say okay one person can churn out two two thousand lines of code per day and in that sense if right. you are estimating exactly. a project so, so those but, days are yeah, gone those yeah, days are gone talks to you when another guy talks to you he just quotes the whole thing saying you know yeah. just say this guy achieved this and when he talks to you about the assignment of work yeah. he doesn't talk to you about the time frame it doesn't say. matter the, the, this language is ex, is is obsolete today because your uh, chat gpt will generate 2000 lines of code in 1 minute what will you At do the back end. Okay. What will you do? You can't compete with that, right? So it is the value add and the modularity and the design cleanliness that the developer brings that matters. It's not the lines of code that matters anymore. How modular, how reusable, how scalable, how stable your code is—that's what matters. Right. I I I took something on what you asked me, Jack GB, uh, of course. Okay. Good. Anything else? जावाजेड He is a fantastic trainer, by the way. So he, oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. He, anything he trains, you can go and sit in that class. You will learn something useful. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, we hope to attract more. I mean, I'm actually very busy in taking certifications now. So, <laughs> yeah, great. You know, and uh, and I get a communication as well. So I have to do justice to all of them. <laughs> right. I try. See. Exactly. So. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 So thank you for providing so much valuable information. My pleasure. My pleasure. I have. I have one question. Yeah. I have background in design field. Now I am in web development. Okay. So I, I want to know where to find the clients for solo web developers. um you want a um, you want to hire web developers huh no no i want to work, find work for freelancing projects oh you want to find work yeah um see there's lot of uh, need for web developers actually you know what you can do is um i'll give you an easy way out okay just uh, okay. um, make some make some application of your own take some open source data set which is you know some so anything any problem space in your you know something about your apartment something about um, uh, election data something about weather data anything take some public space business data set and make some kind of ui and just uh, um, put that as a portfolio see you remember in the olden days these fashion guys the photographers used to have a portfolio for yes. web guys also a portfolio is very useful so you just make a yeah, linkedin yeah. page yeah just make a linkedin page or an instagram page with all your portfolios that will attract lot of client i'm telling you okay, okay just make sure that you use you you really use linkedin you okay, can, okay. Uh, can share your share your work yeah i have done few projects and uh, put it on my website but uh, i haven't you have to promote your project from social so on linkedin you can promote it uh, actively and you can give talks you can upload videos about anything that sort of thing okay okay yeah? okay thank you and there are some uh, groups in linkedin also for, for uh, this kind of thing see there are these freelancer websites you know like your upwork and all that but those yeah, things don't but they are work. very saturated they don't work they don't work i have also uh, yes, i have yes. very bad reviews about those things the best way to do is a yeah, uh, linkedin yeah. jobs linkedin jobs and going the traditional way that is the that linkedin jobs pretty decent nowadays but otherwise it's the the other way works better you put out your work out there and somebody will come looking for you oh yeah that sounds good enough yeah thank you yeah. uh, just just one more thing anuradha uh, when you are now talking about something like well an interpreted language that generates code in the background uh there is that case of uh, the memory management aspect of it also comes into the picture doesn't it which means which has traditionally been somewhat of a 
No, right. interpreted language has nothing to do with the uh, code generating in the background. Uh, interpreted language is a way in which a programming language is converted. Yeah, chat GPT does it. Yeah, it shouldn't be doing having memory issues. A chat GPT looks so simple, but it there's a big behemoth sitting behind chat GPT, right? It's a very sophisticated. Yeah cloud infrastructure they're, they're burning billions of dollars on it it's not so simple right but is it a memory efficient oh, well let's they're see efficient for... not just memory in other resource efficient too not not really they are constantly working on it they also have to reduce their electricity bills like you and me right so they are working on right. it constantly they're working on it constantly okay all right thanks great it, it, it was great talking to you yeah, my pleasure. Okay, I think guys we'll wind up. Thanks for coming. You can always reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any further queries and I'll be happy to help you out. Okay, so my I think I put in my LinkedIn uh, thing somewhere. Yeah, this is my LinkedIn address. So uh, we'll, I'll probably circulate it and uh, it will be there on my LinkedIn page and you can you can get reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks, Anuradha. Thanks, everyone. Bye.